Good afternoon. Uh, good morning, actually. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Curating the Modern Curriculum, the Librarian's Role in Our Transformation to Online Learning, which is sponsored by Springer Nature. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. Um, all the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so no need to worry about generating noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. You can also adjust the size of them to your liking. Uh, we're using the Q&A feature today. Uh, please use it to ask questions of our presenters. The audience for this presentation is large and we expect many questions, so we likely will not have time to get to all of them. but. So we apologize for that, but we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. So please type your questions into the Q&A as they occur to you throughout the presentation. Um, also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Also note that we're recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Um, and with that, we're going to do some quick introductions. So Raquel, do you want to start us off? Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Raquel Horlick, and I am the coordinator for scholarly resources for sciences and engineering at the Howard Tilton Memorial Library at uh, Tulane University in New Orleans. And in my role, I work closely with my fellow coordinators and our physical sciences and data management librarian to manage our sciences and engineering collections and provide instruction and research support to the School of Sciences and Engineering, which is about nine or so different departments. So I look forward to talking to with everyone today. Great. Andres, do you want to do a quick introduction? Thank you, Sabrina. My name is Andres Felipe Chavarria. Uh, I am the uh, director of uh, libraries uh, from Pontificia Universidad Javeriana in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I'm glad to stay here in this moment. It's a great space. I love uh, these uh, people because uh, it's my reference in my country. Great, and Bob, do you wanna do a quick introduction? Sure. Uh, my name is Bob Boise, and I am serving currently as the Director of Account Development for the U.S. and Canada for Springer Nature. Uh, I work with academic, government, uh, corporate libraries of all sizes and shapes, um, and my group provides technical and promotional support, a kind of all-purpose client engagement role. So that's that's what I do, and I'm glad to be here um, moderating the uh, the question period at the end. Great, um, and with that, Raquel, why don't you take it away? Um. Sorry, I'm just waiting to regain control. There we go. <laughs> just a little bit of a delay. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Raquel Horlick. Um, and actually, OK, how do I go back on these slides? I'm sorry. Oh, it's no problem. If you, in the left, bottom left, uh, it should pop up all of the options to go back. Okay. Next to the Tulane logo. Oh, thank you. I thank you. No problem. I do not see that. Okay, so here once again is our a picture of our big beautiful you know university. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, about how we've worked together as a team to ensure that our students, staff, and faculty were still getting the same level of high quality service as when we were, you know, normal. Um, so to start off with, I'm gonna to introduce Tulane University and Tulane University Libraries. 
I'll then go into a COVID-19 timeline. So, so I'll show you how the university and the library uh, immediately responded to COVID. I will go into um, the physical spaces, uh, talk about some collections and collection supports for print and e-resources, as well as streaming resources. We'll talk about how we've managed to still support our faculty and students and some of the lessons learned. So, I, oh, there we go. Um, okay, so Tulane University is, was established in 1834 as a medical college. It is a relatively small private research university in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the USA. We are an AAU institution, um, but it feels more like a, like a liberal arts college because of the emphasis on small class sizes, in-person teaching, and service learning. Um, we have about nine schools, including a medical school and a law school, as well as an undergraduate college. And as you can see, our tuition is not cheap. The Tulane Library. So I work at the Howard Tilton Memorial Library, which is one of five uh, libraries and special collections that fall under this Tulane University Library's umbrella. Um, so we do not support the School of Business or the School of Law. They have their own libraries. And there actually are several other special collections on campus. Um, we work closely with them. But when I refer to the Tulane University libraries, I'm really referring to those five uh, libraries and special collections that fall under the same dean. And as you can see throughout the years, we've managed to build and maintain a, a nice size uh, collection. Okay, so then COVID-19 appeared in Louisiana and things started to look a little bit different on campus. Let's take a look at that. Okay, try this again. Okay, so I've divided up our timeline into two periods because, you know, COVID-19 is, has been going on for a while and it's still ongoing. So, um, and with each new phase, we've kind of modified our policies and our response. So we're gonna have the COVID remote period, which was March, 2020 and summer, 2020. And then the COVID-19 in-person and hybrid period which falls under fall 2020, spring 2021, and now. Um, this photo you see was taken by my colleague, uh, Jane Panzino, uh, earlier this week. So get a sense, a sneak peek of what it looks like here. Okay. So uh, like other institutions, uh, when Louisiana got its first case of COVID-19, things moved pretty fast. On March 11th, we learned that um, classes were gonna be on pause. Students had to move from, uh, from the dorms and faculty needed to transition their in-person classes to online classes. And we didn't really have a culture of remote instruction prior to this. So this was a big and sudden change. Uh, in the beginning, all the Tulane libraries and archives, the physical locations closed and staff and librarians transitioned to remote work. Um, when the library closed, we did give faculty and graduate students an opportunity to come collect the items in their apparel. At this time, we created and started our book mail and pickup service. I'll be talking more about that later. We also had to return our unspent, non-endowed capital funds to the university. Uh, they needed the money to get the campus ready for an on-site semester. Right. So Tulane really wanted to bring students back for an in-person semester. Um, that obviously poses a lot of challenges, but the emphasis on like service learning and small in-person classes is really what attracted a lot of people to Tulane in the first place. Um, so we wanted to bring that back. Um, obviously, this, this was not cheap. I think yes, we had to build out 13 new classrooms, so those are the classrooms in the photo, as well as some multi-use space uh, to ensure proper social distancing. Um, there was regular testing for students, staff, and faculty. 
Um, we are able to do our own COVID-19 test internally at Tulane, and I think that is really why we were able to uh, test our students, test our faculty um, as often as we did. Um, in addition, there, um, the university rented out a hotel and reserved space for isolation uh, and quarantine cases for students who were on campus. And then we kind of had like the normal social distancing precautions um, in place. So face masks and doors, you know, plexiglass, movable of chairs. And once uh, vacation uh, vaccinations became available, Tulane vaccinated anyone who was, who was interested. Um, so Tulane libraries reopened, although many of the staff and librarians remained uh, remote for the beginning. Um, all of our workshops and instruction, research supports, moved to virtual supports. And we decided to quarantine books for 72 hours after use as a precaution along some of those more traditional COVID-19 safety protocols. Um, we didn't really know our budget until about October and November, which was uh, stressful and limited our ability to make purchases, as you can imagine. Okay, so here we are now, we're in fall 2021, and not really much has, has changed. Um, there are fewer online uh, classes. Again, they really wanted an in-person semester. Uh, we have eased up a little bit on the social distancing and safety precautions, but masks are still required indoors. And even though we are all on campus, um, we continue to offer research support and instruction through, through Zoom. It is in demand. Uh, vaccinations are mandatory for our students and highly encouraged for staff and faculty. And just wanna highlight in this photo, uh, you will see we have a whole bunch of students kind of gathered with their luggage. You would think that they were moving in. Um, actually, this was taken one week after classes started this year when Hurricane Ida forced uh, students to evacuate. So these students were evacuating. Um, classes were canceled, moved to online, and this is the first week we've been back. So we've had um, you know, two weeks of actual in-class instruction. Okay, so um, during the COVID-19 remote period, again, March and spring, the, all the buildings closed, including the archives and special collections, everyone transitioned to online. At some point, our technical services and interlibrary loan staff returned to the building so that they can offer this book delivery, um, where students will you know, submit a request through the catalog to either have a book mailed to them or to pick it up on campus. And we often get requests from faculty and students to have to prepare their items for them. Um, so I think that was, that was appreciated. So while the university and library was physically open, um, many librarians and staff chose to remain primarily, primarily remote, although now we're all pretty much back. Um, we had a lot of social distancing and precautionary measures in place in the building, like removing a lot of extra chairs and some tables, closing some study spaces, um, adding plexiglass to uh, student tables and service points, hand sanitizing stations, uh, masks, um, and everyone, of course, has to wear face masks. Um, the archive and special collections we reopened by appointment. And our uh, book delivery service was really such a success. We're probably gonna be continuing that for the foreseeable future. And this is you know, kind of where we're at now. Okay. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, collection issues again during the remote period and then on our on in-person period. So we had to return any of the unspent non-endowed capital funds to the university. So we can continue to pay our bills, but we were restricted in terms of what we could buy. One-time purchases now required approval from the Tulane Budget Office with justification and exact cost, which is an extra step um, for, for everyone. Uh, we received our budget in November 2020, which was much later than expected. 
So we had to plan for different levels of cuts because we were imagining there would be cuts. Um, so 10% cut and the scary 30% cuts. And this is you know, obviously never fun, especially when you're already trying, struggling to find things to, to cut. Uh, we've had a flat budget the last many, many years. Um, so already if we wanna add something, we usually have to cancel something. Um, and usually, you know, already we're in a situation where we have to deny some of the uh, resources requests. They are usually more expensive um, than uh, print resources. And again, our budget hasn't been given a boost. Uh, books that we did order were either held at the vendor's warehouse or at the library warehouse. Um, and a staff member in cataloging would come pick up a box, bring it home, do some cataloging. Um, but as you can see, even though the books may have arrived to, to campus and they, they may have been ordered, uh, they're in boxes and not always easy to find. So that was uh, a challenge. Um, at Tulane, at our library, we did not purchase textbooks, uh, but faculty can print other books or copies of their own personal uh, textbook uh, on hold. So we, we wanted to expand that service. Um, we will now purchase up to like two additional print copies of a course reserve book, um, or uh, ideally purchase an unlimited uh, license to that resource. And, you know, with space always being tight, purchasing additional copies of something, um, you know, we, we have some concerns with, you know, essentially shelving. Okay, so as I had already mentioned, um, we were in budget purgatory, which meant we had to be highly critical of any purchase request. Uh, we were getting demands uh, for resources from faculty, um, sometimes based on a, like this mass wave of direct promotion and advertisements uh, faculty were getting from vendors. So sometimes the vendor promotion would be to let them know about like maybe an expansion of a service um, that we already have, like removing limits on simultaneous use with eBooks. Um, and that is great. Other times the promotion was for free trials to very expensive products or journals that we do not have. And that, that was a problem because when free access disappears, we may not be able to purchase the product. And our policy for um, product trials is that we limit our trials to products we know we can actually afford and meet our collections policies. Uh, within the sciences and engineering, our Kind of collection habits didn't really change much. We were pretty much uh, focused on e-businesses anyways, but my colleagues in the humanities and social sciences um, ha did indeed increase their spending on e-resources and modified their approval profiles as such. There was an increased demand for streaming media, already a, a big demand, um, but this was even larger. And we began licensing digital site licenses for streaming media, which is something we wanted, but didn't previously have the ability to, ho to host these resources. And with uh, everything being remote, we had more access issues, usually pertaining to authentication. So we were getting a lot of emails for tech support. We installed our first uh, ever self-checkout machine, books to go and we've been wanting one of those for a long time as well. And again, they were expensive. Okay, so with the move to online courses and the lack of many um, large classrooms and lab space, faculty were looking online for other tools that they can use um, to either kind of supplement or re replace some of those experiences. And faculty became more aware of uh, digital resources and platforms um, that kind of have more comprehensive packages where they have more interactive and they are more than just a journal. They're usually a journal plus maybe some writing resources or some videos um, or career databases. And these tended to be more like interactive um, resources that we didn't traditionally consider to be library purchases, library products. And often it was a real challenge trying to figure out what to do with these requests. 
Um, should they fall under the library or should they fall under a department uh, that focuses on you know, teaching strategies? Uh, often things would still kind of remain with no real conclusion. Um, the sub our subject specific library guides now appear on course pages in Canvas, which is our course management system. And with the move to everything being online at a point, this was exciting because that meant more people will actually um, see this new edition. Um, now that everyone was more comfortable with the Zoom, uh, it was much easier to reach out and meet with our, our colleagues, um, as well as other um, students and faculty at different campuses. And SMS is always something that students have been comfortable with, and it's less intimidating, perhaps, than going for in-person help. Um, so I think that, you know, was appreciated. Um, lab archives uh, was an electronic lab notebook uh, that was purchased, but not yet pushed. Uh, so it, it got a lot of attention in event remotes because people are now seeing the value. And although not a library resource, we offer training and support, which has gotten us greater exposure and helped us build our, our connections with different departments. We released many new digitized collections and expanded our scan and deliver service to now include undergraduates. So this service is when we would scan either a chapter of a book or an article from a journal that's in print and then email it to the requester. And before it was, it was limited to uh, faculty and grad students, but we've been able to expand. All right. Okay, student um, retention. So the cancellation of many events and conferences uh, opened up more opportunity for all staff library meetings. Uh, so these meetings included guest speakers from a wide range of campus departments uh, working to improve accessibility and inclusion at Tulane University. And these are areas that we are, have decided to focus a lot of our attention on this year. Um, and we've even created an internal uh, DEI committee. Um, I created a textbook task force, which consisted of members from the Tulane University Libraries, the Business Library, Center for Academic Equity, and Center for Engaged Learning and Teaching. And we are kind of exploring how other universities handle textbooks and their cost. Um, the attitudes towards them on our campus from students and faculty, and you know, trying to figure out some possible ways we can address this rising cost of textbooks. This collaboration has also led us to offer additional uh, OER programming with support from other campus groups. Um, we signed two read and publish agreements, um, you know, which will be great for our students and our faculty who are, who are trying to, to publish. And we are looking to sign more. And you know, we're kind of continuously trying to address the academic needs as well as the financial and health accessibility needs of our, uh, our population. It's really important to us. But truth be told, in and of itself, Tulane is not an affordable university. It's, it is quite, quite expensive. Um, so some lessons learned. This is where I'm gonna end. Um, remote instruction and research assistance is possible and it facilitates cross-campus work. Um, Tulane never had a culture of remote work before and um, even though like, we now have some remote classes and programs, it, it's relatively new, it's growing here. Um, you know, we just got back to campus and we are still being asked to teach through Zoom. Um, with global warming causing more natural disasters and emergencies like Hurricane Ida, there will be more evacuations and a need for isolation in the near future. So remote work with and instruction is gonna play a large role in that. Um, if it weren't for us getting a, our remote instruction together during the COVID-19 uh, period, we would have really struggled during Hurricane Ida and we would have lost, students would have lost a lot of time. Um, 
So book our book delivery by mail and pickup uh, really works. I know that this has been used at other libraries, but it was something we never tried, so that was neat. Uh, it's also, this experience also clearly highlighted the limitations of traditional print course reserves. Um, because having a 72 hour quarantine period for a course reserve kind of defeated the purpose of having it on, res on reserve. And there was no real surprise that there was a greater demand for e-resources and uh, streaming media. Um, one thing, you know, we, we all, a lot of us did talk about was the fact that maybe more technology support uh, skills might, and training might be required for librarians and staff in the future because a good deal of our, um, you know, questions from students and faculty had to do with technology. And I just want to say thank you um, to some of my colleagues and for to Choice um, and Springer Nature for, for having me here today. Uh, these people either kind of looked things over or chatted with me or provided me with some data. And I'm really, I'm grateful for the team that we have. And I just want to thank all of you for, for spending your time today to listen to our experiences. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, again. Uh, my university is uh, the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana. It's a private Colombian university funded in 1930 and run by the Society of Jesus. It was two offices, uh, the main one in Bogota and the other, uh, another sectional in one in Cali. Uh, the first, uh, has uh, 18 faculties, uh, 213 academic programs, and 21 uh, PhD programs, uh, 158 uh, uh, postgraduate degrees, and an additional uh, two, uh, 62 departments and 14 institutes. The Cali sectional has uh, 25 programs. Uh, we have a general library and four libraries and faculties and Cali section. We have a uh, 41 librarians and 79 staff. Among the five libraries, there are more than a uh, 5,300 uh, volumes uh, of printed books, more than a uh, 5,100 uh, electronic books, more than uh, 160,000 uh, database, more than uh, 38,000 electronic journals, in more than uh, 6,000 printed journals. In addition, uh, more than 68,000 uh, degrees and thesis uh, of graduate school, uh, students and PhD students from the university. Uh, this is my university in, uh, in, in summer. This is the content of my presentation. Four points. Library essential for providing resource, uh, setting to support, pandemic and more digital resource, and courses, and support in reducing costs. The first point, we create new methodologies with big data to measure collection and the syllabuses for each of the 7,000 different classes delivered at our university. We call it data-driven Javeriano. The new methodology create was presented at an academic event in May 2020 in Barcelona, Spain. And we trained a group of universities in Medellin, Colombia, called GA, to implement this methodology within their universities. 
we identified the bibliographic materials needed and pointed the material we already had, which consisted in 75,000 different titles. We also discovered that we needed an additional 9,000 titles to provide faculty with the material needed for all these classes. These 9,000 titles are made up of open access publication, 8%, the remaining 92% of the, this material is made up of printed and electronic books, as well as journal subscription. Of these, only 20% is available in digital formats and 80% is printed for. With these results, we, bu we built different strategies to access and make them available in our faculties. We drew the materials to make them permanently available with PERMA.cc, which is Harvard University software. And we registered, registered in our catalog. We also evaluate software to connect all our bibliographic materials and resources old and new to each individual classes and to allow the students and, and teachers to directly download them or access them in whatever format and resource exists. With different, uh, we evaluate several softwares comprised such apps called um, Sage, Springer, and others. And we throw the best two that will uh, serve our purpose were Telespire uh, by Sage on e-reserve uh, by Springer. We decide to go uh, with e-reserve from Springer uh, as Telespire is only available in American, British, and Asian, uh, Asian markets. Additionally, we assign a special team of 13 professionals as licensed librarians to assist, assist students and teachers of specific faculties and another groups of 15 auxiliaries uh, to support this work. This group provides support to replace the material needed by students and teachers on research classes and copyright. We first embarked, uh, embarked in comprehensive, in comprehensive uh, training programs to prepare the group of 15 auxiliaries in specific competencies to assist the teaching, learning process, technical process, information analysis, preservation, and scientific communication. To this group, we added another four people for work backstage in collection development and technical processing. To achieve this, we transformed services and processes automating, automating many this in order to be able uh, to work in both live and virtual environments. We adopted the security measures as required by local and national government, adopted the spaces and create new services area for bibliographic loans, and even expanded home lending to reach everywhere in the country. This also forced us to close collection and create protocols to isolate the bibliographic materials will end for 14 days. We acquire new technology and software and so forth for this change. We expanded our collection channels in our communication. And for this, we use WhatsApp, phone, mail, web forms, Teams, Zoom, and even LibCalc and our university chatbot. 
we improved our guides for self-learning and included new guides for support activities such as research and encouragement uh, of reading. We improved our bibliographic resource search tools and expanded the use of electronic resource to support teaching activities. We recommended that libraries transform their respective teams to expand their scope, uh, coverage, and wor working abilities to assist teaching, learning, and research process, and automate those services that do not require permanent, permanent human intervention, loans, technology, learning, spaces, environment. For this point, in my library, we built a better and larger collection with digital resources, such as books, videos, guides, and teaching learning materials, as well as research resources. Some of this material is open access, and after evaluating all the resources available, we discovered that only 20% these materials were available in the marking digital format. We also included uh, two virtual labs, one for science faculty, which provide services across several faculties, such as medicine, nursing, engineering, and others. And one for ecology faculty, which also provides services of the social science, communication, and the other faculties. We have, we have budgeted uh, an additional investment over next three years of around uh, 900,000 over and above the current uh, budget of 1.3 million per year for bibliographic resources. The use of our electronic resources, such as books, journal, and databases, has increased considerably, not only in terms of access, but also in terms of the downloads, which so shows uh, that this material has been read and even used, used in classroom. We made an agreement with the national government to legally allow us to make digital copies uh, of our materials, which allowed us to obtain a copyright license from the official Colombian agency. Another challenge uh, we are uh, facing and Tackling is the creation of the strategy to about students and teachers uh, with open science and open access services, for which we are designing a, an open science policy. And we are working collaboratively with the honor universities in negotiation of resources and the implementation of the transformative agreements, which one, uh, once he concluded uh, will be the first of the key of the kind in Latin America. The measuring of the impacts of our programs and investment is always aligned to our institutional strategy. Uh, and this is carried of the through two concrete lines of actions. Investigation, uh, we are uh, where was uh, measuring the impact society uh, of all that is created by resources a uh, truth or Christ, a system which provide metrics and visualization of results. Creation and learning ecosystem, we were, um, where we, where we um, have different strategies uh, with one of them uh, being they use the data mining uh, to measure academic excellence 
uh, and predict students behavior to implement students backup support strategies and counseling, mentoring, wellness, and information to prevent students desertion. Finally, in this point, we are beginning to implement a strategy of the creation of open educational resource, which involves creating resource from the university, uh, university and using existing ones in the, in the world. This is a collaborative work we are doing with the Attico Center, a service area of the Javeriana University in charge uh, of the all audi uh, audiovisual communication services, such as film, radio, and television for classes and research. Likewise, uh, we continue to promote uh, the wider use of open access resource in, in the silos. We create training programs for teachers with the support of CHI, in English, is Center for Learning, Teaching, and Evaluation. In these programs, we train teachers in how to select pro bibliographic material for their uh, syllabi, uh, how they fight uh, plagiarism, and how they take advantage uh, of information and teaching process. With the vice chancellor's office, for research, we are creating the university crisis, and we are supporting professors to create their profiles in ORCID, Research ID, Google Scholar, and your national research system. We also expanded our services offering using scientific intelligence and support process in graphics and visualization of content when resources such as Bosbiver, Gephi, among others. We are also on the road on creation in open science policy and creation of services that will support a new road. This is my university. Uh, this is um, our actions in this phenomenon uh, pandemic. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hear the questions. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, I I have turned on my video and uh, and uh, we'll start the questions. We do have some questions from the audience, uh, as you said before, a very large audience. Um, but um, before I launch into those, I just want to say one word to the folks. Um, you will be getting a. a, a communication from Springer Nature um, sometime earlier, probably next week, um, that will uh, give you access to more resources related to this presentation. Um, the resources are free. Uh, you put a few lines into a form and be able to get access to them. Uh, you'll have anecdotes and podcasts and things from researchers and professors telling their story of how they've had to teach and manage research during the pandemic. And we hope that you enjoy those resources. And again, you'll be getting that email. Um, also a personal comment, um, I, I date myself severely when I say that my uh, almost my entire higher education occurred uh, before the internet occurred. Uh, and I was just couldn't help thinking that that it's really quite lucky that we didn't have a pandemic when I was going to school because I'm not exactly sure how we would have completely managed it uh, in that case. And that brings me to one of the questions that I wanna ask first, and because it's, it's, it's you know, pretty factual. You'll, you should be able to get an exact answer on this. Um, we've had a, um, a student who works as a library assistant ask about the quarantine period for the print books. Uh, We'd like to know, first of all, are you still observing a 72 hour quarantine on print books after they've been used? And and if you are observing a quarantine, uh, what happens to the other students who want that book, um, especially if it's a reserved book? So um, maybe Raquel can answer that first and then Andres after. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's my understanding that we are still keeping with a 72 hour um, quarantine. Uh, it goes alongside some of the other precautions that we're taking. Um, when it, somebody wanted to put a book on Resorve, we now try and get like an unlimited ebook copy if possible. Um, or we also purchase two other copies of that same book. Um, so that increases the chance that someone will be able to check it out. But to be honest, there really hasn't been much of a demand for print. Um, you know, no, no more or no less than, than before. Got it. That's it. Andres, how are you doing with your uh, quarantine periods on print materials? Are you still doing that? Uh, the resources uh, that were to support the classes uh, had an electronic version and several printed copies. The other resource uh, that we needed uh, were uh, with the other institutions uh, for a interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, let's switch to a different question. Um, uh, there was a point, Raquel, maybe you answered this in your presentation, but but partway through your presentation where you talked about some one-time purchases that were made specific to the pandemic. And it was asked, were these in a particular format? Were they print books, eBooks, streaming video? What was, what was the one-time purchases format? Um, that's, a great, that's a great question. I, I, I didn't answer uh, that. It was actually all of those. All um, of them. That could be like a one-time per, uh, purchase. Um, usually there were faculty requests that we presented to our uh, budget office um, for approval. And I don't believe that there was a price limit. We just had to provide um, justification. Okay. Um, any special formats, uh, Andres, that you, that you had to purchase that maybe you might not have purchased that much in that format before? Uh, uh, my university, uh, this situation is no problem because um, before the pandemic, uh, we have a different format. For example, uh, for music uh, in, in audio uh, format and video format. Uh, for example, uh, we have a video club, uh, 20, uh, 20 years ago, but uh, four years ago, this uh, video club is more strong. Uh, for this situation, uh, this format is, uh, is all right for, for my university. Okay, all right. Um, another very practical question. Uh, uh, I know Raquel, you said that you did and you approve of the idea of sometimes mailing books. Um, then the question was asked, did the mailing costs for book delivery come out of the library's budget or someplace else on the university campus? It'd be so nice if it came from someplace else. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, it, it comes from our budget. I think it actually is coming from like our ILL uh, funds. Okay, for interlibrary loan, regular funds, okay. Interlibrary loans, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, Andres, do you, do you mail any things to people's residences? We create agreement with the university direct directives uh, for this uh, budget. It's interesting because for students, uh, the cost for uh, delivery um, mailing is only uh, uh, $2. Uh, $2 uh, for receive, $2 for send uh, these materials for any place uh, of my country. OK. Very good. Um, now, the questions are keep popping up, so I don't have to go to any of the questions that I wrote up there. These are all coming from the audience. A uh, uh, question, particularly for Raquel, but maybe Andreas will have something to say. Um, did your library uh, digitize all your reserves or some or all of them? If so, how did you handle copyright? Um, yeah, no, we, we didn't digitize anything that we didn't, we didn't own. I guess. That is a, that's a good question. I mentioned we digitized some more of our collections. I was thinking a lot of it was more of the, um, you know, the archived collections, um, like special collections in particular. Um, yeah, copyrights kind of dictates what we can or cannot do. 
Okay. Andreas, I know you, you had a slide there about, you know, a, a national copyright agreement that you had. Um, it, it, maybe you could say a couple more words about that. Yes, uh, we needed this uh, agreement because uh, we are unable to digital site collection uh, due to copyright restriction. Um, this agreement uh, was necessary because um, the limit for digital sites, for example, one book for my university was a uh, 30% for book, not for the students, not for teaching, uh, in in for all university. Uh, this agreement is is new because this agreement uh, was uh, the past uh, 19 June. Is 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 very near. Okay, got it. Okay. Um... Yeah, here's a question about uh, library faculty, you know, interaction. Um, and the question is, uh, maybe maybe we'll start with Andreas this time. What luck have you had encouraging instructors to use electronic resources when they might have been in the past more familiar with physical, you know, paper content or other physical content? Um, so ha have you had any luck, you know, help getting the professors to that area? Uh, and 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 the second follow up to that is, do you how do you plan to approach that conversation after the pandemic, if at all? Oh, oh, it's, this is difficult because um, uh, this period, for example, uh, this uh, uncertainty phenomenon uh, is is difficult for teachers and um, teachers. Uh, don't have use uh, uh, copyright rules, for example. Uh, many teachers uh, needed uh, books in, in digital, we, wherever uh, these restrictions. Um, we need uh, training, uh, but this training is necessary uh, make, made with the special areas in my university, for example. Uh, my university uh, have a unit uh, called a, a CHI. CHI is Center oh, yeah. for Training for, for Teachers. And this strategy is necessary because this, uh, this group uh, have a, a linguist uh, have a strategy necessary for teach, uh, for talk, for hear the teachers. Uh, this is a special area. Uh, this is my recommendation, is work with uh, the people, uh, groups, or uh, spaces, uh, uh, the better uh, make these strategies. Uh, this is for us and, and work out, this is okay. It sounds like that, that Kai, uh, you know, kind of organization is 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 going to be the the center of some of that work with the professors. So that's very interesting. I'm glad you have that, uh, Raquel. If did you want to talk about you know working with the uh, I don't know print centric professors? I, I know that, you know. Well, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I I could speak mostly to sciences engineering and yeah. We we've, we've been on eBook resources. Um, I think though my human the humanities librarian commented that. Like the surprise by the by the interest in in ebooks because we figured you know that might be the hardest group to make the transition but shockingly you know they if they need something they need it it doesn't really matter yeah i i've watched with interest some people talking about um like anatomy education and this use of um you know kind of visualized or uh, anatomy work um very interesting. Um, uh, let's see, another question. Um, yeah, um, for, for library instruction in particular, when you're you know, doing your own training of, of the students, for example, uh, how have you been able to adapt um, from in-person library instruction to an online format? Um, you know, did you, um, did you do active learning and knowledge check and assessment, things like that, to, to find out if you were succeeding? Um, Ra Raquel, why don't you go first on this one? Yeah, so, you know, inst instruction was, was interesting. 
Um, prior to COVID-19, we were doing workshops in person and through Zoom. So some good portion of us had more uh, experience with remote teaching than a lot of the faculty at that point. Um, so when we had to like move um, remote, uh, we were there to kind of, we could offer our own guidance, especially when it comes to how to make this more interactive by, you know, we encourage the use of breakout rooms when possible, um, you know, ensuring, asking students to keep their, their camera on, having polls and um, discussions and using, supplementing all of the, the class time with the course management software, using those discussion boards um, to encourage more like interactive component, but it, it was tricky, especially when we had the hybrid classes where some of the students were online, some were in person. So it's not as though we can do a breakout room only because that would only apply to the ones online and can't do it in person because, so those were kind of hard to navigate. We're still figuring that one out. Okay, got it. Uh, Andreas, yeah, how are, how are you doing? Uh, do, you do, do you offer some library instruction and how do you do it? Oh, it's, it's difficult because before uh, a pandemic uh, situation, uh, we are training our group uh, about different information literacy and training, but uh, uh, introduce, for example, uh, active learning and the others but not for online uh, space. It, this is <laughs> what's crazy. For example, uh, uh, many things changed in the process of information literacy training for first year students. Uh, Thirds of the beginning of the pandemic were uh, virtual. And now we are half to do them in small groups. Uh, uh, we use uh, the play games uh, that allow it, uh, them interact and socialize in person. Now we have to create online learning infrastructure to execute uh, those uh, actions and expand the communication channels and respond to all these concerns. All these strategies uh, was necessary training my group. Uh, my group uh, training, um, after the, the first clause in my country, my first clause of quarantine for, for population was a uh, 70 March. Uh, uh, I, we take uh, three weeks for a uh, intensive uh, training for, for librarians. It's, it's, it's interesting because uh, since this period, uh, the services continue normally but at the same time, uh, training my, my team. Okay, good. Well, we're down to our last little bit of time here. Uh, maybe some quick answers here, Raquel, on streaming media. media. Do, you, do you have any sense of the use of that for, let's say, courses versus, say, personal use? Do you have any um, I, I, I do not. I can tell you overall right now, uh, you know, in fiscal year 2019, 63% of our content was streaming. Now it's about 96.9%. I do believe our media services librarian, she keeps really good track of this. Um, if you contact her, I'm sure she's yeah. happy to talk with you. Okay, media services, got it. Uh, Andreas, do you, do you, have you seen, uh, do you see some use for, for class use of, of streaming media? Uh, yes, or, yes, uh, yeah. for, for, for me, they, the situation is, is like uh, Raquel, but my institution, uh, we have uh, other uh, space uh, like Attico Center. Attico Center is a special site in films, uh, radio, television, and this space uh, provide uh, services about this. And in a strategy between libraries and Attico Center, uh, we have uh, many services about the streaming. This is interesting because it's, it's a special site in this team, in this uh, subject. Okay, uh, very last question. Um, any troubles uh, communicating with the faculty of, about specifically about their research needs as opposed to class teaching? Are they doing okay with their research needs? Uh, Andreas, why don't you? Okay, it's interesting because um, 
in my university, my team uh, have uh, work like a licensed library. Um, my team, a uh, first team, uh, for example, uh, was a uh, 13 librarians. But uh, in this time, uh, we create a special unit for these services and research uh, for classes. And this team uh, have a uh, other staff group. Uh, it's more, more, more big group, and the result is great because uh, their uh, librarians now is uh, co-authors for articles and participate actively in research. Uh, this change uh, was necessary. But I training or this special group for uh, 13 uh, librarians in PhD for uh, better uh, abilities in, in, in research. Okay, so you've, you've formed a special group to, to, to handle that kind of thing. Raquel, last, last uh, answer. Um, are you keeping up with your faculty's research needs? Yes, I'm taking notes of what Andres is saying. Yeah. We need to do that. Um, especially, you know, uh, it was hard with outreach kind of moving, moving entirely online. So we didn't really see much of our faculty, but for the most part, we didn't really see much faculty in the library anyways. So yeah. most of our communication over the years and you know, I may be wrong for the, the humanities, but um, in the science and engineering, most of our communication has been uh, online. So it yeah. was not a huge change for in terms of how we work with them. Okay. Well, we do have other questions, but we don't have other time. So uh, I'm gonna draw, draw to an end the question and answer period and, and back to Sabrina. Great, thanks, Bob. And thanks to Raquel and Andres. This is Sabrina Kofer from ACRL and Choice. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to present today. It was a really useful and valuable discussion. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we recorded today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Uh, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we really appreciate it. They, uh, your responses help our presentations. So thanks again to everyone out there for joining us today. Thank you all for presenting. Um, I hope everyone learned a little bit from the session and we hope to see you again on a future webinar. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>